Yeah, thank you, Jen. That was <laughs> thank you. That was perfect. Um, right. Yeah, I'm going to say a couple things about sort of situating the cloud strategy in our overall infrastructure initiative, for which Jen is our executive sponsor, and and sort of wanted to talk about how we think about the cloud in that. And uh, so, you know, in the um, so, all right, so let me step back. And as Jen mentioned, we have this aging data center. It's really reached its full capacity from both a power and space perspective. And then we kind of laugh, and I've said this so many times, you may have heard it, but when we looked at the date that it was started, you know, it was put online five years before the first iPhone existed. It was put online before there was a public cloud, before AWS was even a blink in or a twinkle in Jeff Bezos's eye. So, um, the world has really changed a lot. And so here in the grand cloud first narrative, this is the time when a company, uh, when they have this behemoth old aging thing, should just map everything in there to different applications and latencies and everything and do a digital transformation effort and go cloud first. So that's the narrative. Um, and you know we are transforming and we are creating a new roadmap for the services that IT provides to the university. Um, and we began by asking what a top ranked research university needs from its infrastructure. So um, what does the university need in its computing infrastructure? So to answer this, um, I've adopted some of the approaches of classic product management uh, to make sure that we understand the needs, pain points and drivers of the people that we're serving. And I'll share that with you in a minute. Uh, the initiative has spent a lot of time um, speaking with leaders across multiple industries to get perspective widely, also across higher education. Um, and we've spent a ton of time with local stakeholders. So we started interviewing people last year. We've spoken to hundreds of people, IT staff, faculty, students, labs, campus leaders, um, and we've really tried to understand their needs. And so the framework we created is known as a feature comparison chart and it's to map the different types of computing people needs that people have to the specific characteristics of those. And then we could see the broader patterns. And what the data showed us was that we distilled into three basic categories. And so we're moving away from a one size fits all solution because that's not really gonna solve the problem here um, and finding a way of giving the right tool for the job to our people. So there was three basic categories that we built our three pillar infrastructure model around. So um, first we have what we've always had, a traditional data center computing offering that doesn't really need to be on site. It doesn't need to be on the campus. So this pillar is focusing on energy efficiency, um, low cost of power, green energy. Uh, and last year, there was a lot of demand for that kind of computing. Research labs bought a million. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Are you, meant, are you intended to be sharing slides? No, I'm not. I just okay. wanted to chat. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Um, no, no, no worries. I will um, share afterwards. Uh, I'll share a link to our feature comparison chart because it's a framework that other universities have also adopted. Um, so it sort of shows how we steer things to one or another. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of, we had a million dollars uh, of computing bought into our high performance computing cluster. And actually last month we had Gary Jung, who I see here today uh, from LBL and he has shared, and, and so you can look at last month's if you weren't there uh, to see the details of his exhaustive study of the costs of HPC or high performance computing on premises versus the public cloud. And there's no way of skinning this cat that doesn't make the public cloud cost three to five times more. And this is a fairly large installation. Uh, and that's research that's been done at Berkeley, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and also at Stanford. Uh, and so that is a capability that really needs to be in traditional uh, data centers. And actually, the quiet secret here is I've spoken with the Poster Children University of Cloud First, and they've told me quietly and off the record that they all have significant data centers supporting research. Um, the second pillar of our three pillar infrastructure strategy is local computing labs, robots, equipment. This is including you know, what's commonly called edge computing, but also things like robots, equipment that's in the scientific loop. Think of microscopes, including equipment that's being invented here, um, like the microscopes, but also new kinds of hardware, new kinds of computing. So right now, IT is not meeting the legitimate differentiated needs that we have on the campus for that. And as a result, we again look to the data Facilities data 
showed us that the adoption of local server closets rose 20 to 25 percent over the last several years. So we need to develop more efficient offerings that meet those needs on the campus uh, so that we can get more controlled environments, because a lot of those closets are generating physical plant issues, problems with HVAC systems, hazards, and, and, and also cybersecurity issues in general, uh, also being three to four times more expensive than the power we deliver in the data center. So this is all a big preamble to say, what of the cloud then, which is our third pillar. So 80% of the university's computing is really about supporting academic research. Uh, and probably 99% of our public cloud adoption isn't really guided or isn't really inside of central IT, it's adopted um, by researchers. And you know, there's some exceptions. So notable one is our fundraising tools uh, used by university development. Those are super well aligned with the public cloud based on their needs for elasticity and scalability when we do big fundraising. Cal Performances runs a lot of their systems on AWS. Uh, so these are actually like entire businesses embedded inside the university. And so um, other than those exceptions, by and large, the adoption that we're seeing is that which enables research. And researchers are building cloud native applications and tooling um, because they're getting the best results by treating the cloud not as a destination or a place to put their computers, but as a set of capabilities um, and affordances that just aren't possible in the traditional computing models. So from a CTO perspective, to enable the business, in the sort of stereotype language here, we need labs and researchers to be able to select the right tool, including the right cloud for the job, which is why we're multi-cloud. And so for the, you know, and that, that may be driven by technical reasons. Um, so if you look at the characteristics of GCP, say versus AWS, there's certain use cases that lend to one or the other, but often it's because they're doing joint research with another institution and a project that's already on a specific cloud. So as we move into the fireside chat, we're going to hear from the cloud team about what they're working on to operationalize this high level strategy of research enablement and making no friction for the public cloud. Um, and most of what they have done so far is best efforts. You know, as Jen said, there wasn't investment and intentional support from the institution around this. So it's been uh, the team really trying to do what they can to make sure that the right contracts are in place. And I see David Wilson uh, is on here. Um, getting security, guardrails and protections so people don't have runaway costs and make, and thinking about self-service for things. So there's as little friction as possible so that researchers can focus on research. And as a result, or you can decide whether it's a result or whether it's gonna happen anyway, but the cloud spending data shows that Berkeley's cloud growth has tripled over the last three years and is probably close to two and a half million dollars today. And so with that, Amy, I really want to turn it over to you and turn this into a really interactive conversation and a fireside chat. And I'm going to get the fire behind me here. And somehow the fire is also behind Walter. Thank you, Bill. And thank you. That was a perfect tee up and a lot of great context um, so that we can make the most out of this conversation. Um, so I want to introduce our speakers today. So um, of course, you've heard from Bill Allison already, our CTO. Thank you, Bill, for that. Um, we also have Walter Stokes here, who is the Director of Data and Platform Services. Hey, Walter. Hello, hello. And also, welcome to Robert Amos, who is the Cloud Team Lead. Hello. Hi, Robert. There you are. Now I can spotlight you. <laughs> Perfect. So welcome everybody. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, let me just get organized here. So to kick things off, I was wondering, um, maybe Walter, you can start and Robert, of course, adding in, if you could tell us a little bit about the overall cloud strategy on campus. Sure, yeah, thanks, Amy. And um... I wanted to pull on a couple of threads there that both Jen brought up and Bill brought up as well. So, you know, we had this cloud strategy that we put together a while back. I think that was in 2016, 2017, and it kind of got shelved at that point. Bill and I kind of took it away and we were like, well, this is still very important. We need to do something here because we need to align with researchers. Um, and so what we did was we tried to, you know, put together at least some kind of a, uh, I want to say an easy on-ramp 
for researchers who had, for example, you know, collaborations, like Bill said, in different public cloud environments, or perhaps had cloud credits that they could use. And what we tried to do is build out a, a very foundational infrastructure for those researchers and other people on campus too, to be able to come in and use some of these public cloud environments that we've got there. Um, and so what we tried to do is align with the, um, the there was a UCOP uh, driven initiative uh, that brought together some central payer accounts so that each different campus had central payer accounts. And, and that way we could consolidate some of the billing into, into one piece there. I'm gonna turn it over to Robert to give you some of the other benefits that we have out there from that. But that was <clears throat> something that we did early and intentionally. So that if you're talking to someone out there in, you know, in the, the world outside of Berkeley, and you say, oh yeah, we have presence in all three clouds, they'll probably look at you like we're crazy, but there are real intention, you know, we're, we're very intentional about that just because there could be researchers that have credits in Azure, for example, that didn't have it in Amazon. And so we wanted to be able to provide them that same kind of foundational infrastructure and build that out uh, as we go. Um, the other thing I was going to say too is, you know, after that, we we have come up with this holistic strategy, like Jen was saying. So, we've we've come up against the fact that we've been able to build this foundational infrastructure in these different areas, and um, and now we're faced with the fact that the data center is somewhat aging and needs to be you know replaced. So we're revamping our whole strategy there. And as Bill said, it's a three pillared strategy with the colo, the local edge, the cloud is going to be a piece of that strategy. So the the use of public cloud, I should say is going to be a big piece of that strategy. And before I turn it over to Robert, I wanted to say I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the fact that we've had a private cloud here, and it's a very vibrant private cloud, VMware-based environment on campus for years. And in fact, that uh, environment, as we've been watching the growth of the public cloud, we've also been keeping our eye on that one, and that, that environment continues to grow as well. So there are different opportunities for different kinds of compute that, that, um, that we just need to be able to, as we go forward, I think that's what we need to speak to in our careers is be able to say, oh yeah, you come to us with a certain, and this is where the cloud, we should talk about the cloud resource center too, put, put that one on the, on the side there. But you know, at some point, if someone comes to the cloud resource center and says, oh, I've got this kind of compute that does X, Y, and Z, then at that point we can say, oh, that's probably, best, you know, depending on what your requirements are, that's best suited for either the VMware cloud, maybe it's best suited for Amazon, maybe it's best suited for GCP. But I wanted Robert to kind of speak a little bit more to the status of what we have running right now since he's in charge of the vCloud uh, area. Yeah, thanks, Walter. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Robert Amos. I'm the Cloud Operations Manager here at Berkeley IT. Just throwing this out there, I've only been here for two years. So I'm one of the, the new people here, so this is great. I'm glad to be here. But yeah, so me and my team focus heavily on uh, focus on two sides. We focus on the private side, like Walter said, and then we focus on the public cloud side. And that's what we're going to talk about here a little bit, or I want to talk about. Um, we focus primarily on AWS and GCP, and we're in the uh, in process of bringing Azure on board. But in those or in our service, it's a self service that we provide for campus. We have our own four pillars, not to be confused with Bill's three pillars for the data center. But um, those pillars are our discounts. UC discounts are negotiated at the UCOP level, so we provide that to the customers. Uh, centralized billing, so each customer out of say our 100 accounts in Am uh, Amazon don't need to do their own PO and billing and charging. We do it at a central level, one PO for everybody. Um, a third pillar is our single sign-on with uh, multi-factor authentication. So a lot of people go to Amazon or Google on their own and they don't have MFA. So this is a big piece of um, keeping the, the private cloud or a public cloud nice and secure. And then the fourth, p uh, fourth pillar is the security model. So right now we have some basic top level security rules in both of our clouds to help our customers provision or get them provisioned into the system. Plus, we're also piloting with the help of uh, our security team, uh, Prisma Cloud, which is a centralized security solution that doesn't just work for Amazon or Google, it works for all three clouds. And our multi-cloud model is Bill mentioned earlier. So those are our four big pillars and that's kind of our current status. Right now we accept everybody who need, wants an Amazon account or wants a Google account can come in, fill out a form, start a ticket. And as long as they have a Calnet account um, through Berkeley, they can get a cloud environment and a COA. I'll forget a charge string as well. Charge string. What about the important one? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks Robert. And I, I wanted to go back again to that cloud uh, strategy that we did too. It's funny that Bill brought up the universities sh that shall remain unnamed that said cloud first, cloud first, cloud first. And it turns out that they actually still have a, a data center that does a lot of research. Cause we heard that at that time too. And um, 
we felt like, wow, cloud first, is that really where we wanted to go? But I remember, Bill, we kind of settled on the strategy of university first, um, which basically is what I was mentioning earlier. Like if someone comes to the cloud resource center and says, hey, we've got X, Y, and Z, where do you think we should land this kind of compute? And I think that's what we've done a pretty good job at is trying to drive people towards different places. Um, and actually I should let, uh, I'll let, I'll let Amy take it from here so that we can ask some of the questions that we want to ask and, and see where that drives the conversation. This is perfect. I love this organic discussion. Thank you for jumping in. Um, so we mentioned a little bit about the fact that um, we have our hands in kind of all of the different public cloud services. I was wondering um, if one of you would like to um, give an overview about our, I mean, our Robert, you talked about our current status, but our offerings, kind of what is our menu that we have to um, offer researchers on campus? Yeah, so um, the menu we have, since it is a self-service, um, we offer, like Walter said, like a front door, a portal into the cloud environment. And after that, the customers can build their own environments for however, however they see fit. Um, the hardest thing from a customer point of view is figuring out where to put your environment. Do we put it in GCP? Do we put it in Amazon? Do we put it back on private? Or maybe it's a SaaS solution. So um, one of the things that we're trying to work on in the future is some way to help those customers get to where they're going. Um, but for uh, other offerings inside of it, um, it, right now it's just as a self-service. Um, a lot of the other UCs are doing something similar. Um, we're potentially looking at some type of managed solution, but right now it's just self-service. I will say this though, the interesting thing about it as we've been comparing and Robert produces charts that shows like the kind of the usage of each one of the different public cloud environments that we have out there. And Amazon has a whole variety, like people are using a whole variety of Amazon features. I mean, there's what, 182 of them. People are using a wide variety of that. What we've noticed is that for Google, a lot of people are just using compute. What is it, Robert? It's like 80% of, of Google usage is actually just for compute. So that's been very interesting for us to see organically how people have figured out what is best in, uh, provided by each one of these different public clouds. Yeah, and we're not finding that in Amazon as much. Uh, researchers like the compute in Google, which I think is specifically Kubernetes for most of our customers. And on the Amazon side, it's the native apps. So like our administrative IT focuses on Amazon because they can use RDS, they can use the API gateway that Amazon provides and use those native tools, which give them a more cost savings than putting say an EC2 or a compute resource and try to uh, make a, you know, a lift and shift from on-prem to the cloud, which is a huge cost increase when you do it that way. If you can use the native apps or redesign your application to use native applications, we're finding big success in that in the, uh, the Amazon side specifically. One thing I wanted to point out too, just in terms of status, Robert mentioned that Azure, because I saw Greg on here before too, um, Azure is coming soon. What we're learning is that Azure, um, the use of credits within Azure is a little challenging um, and just getting people started on that's a little challenging. So I believe um, Blaine is working with some uh, initial, I don't want to call them guinea pigs, but some initial business partners that are interested in exploring Azure at this point. Uh, so that we can try to have um, the same kind of consistent uh, experience there in Azure uh, as we have in the other ones. And I'll also say this too, from a security perspective, we're also trying to, you know, we're trying to build foundational infrastructure in each one of those three public cloud environments. And we want to have a, a good security posture in each one. So with Azure, we also took a little bit of extra time and included Jake in, to, in that process from the very beginning, because we knew that AWS, the, you know, the horses had left the barn by the time we kind of got it. And there was a lot of stuff going on out there. With Azure, we tried to build up the security posture from the get-go. Uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing is too, is Prisma. I don't know if you want to talk to Prisma, Robert, or Jake, you want to talk to Prisma at all. Prisma is a, a tool that we're going to be rolling out across all three of these different clouds to provide us a, I want to say a one pane of glass experience for the security team to be able to monitor and manage a lot of the security in each one of these public cloud environments. Yeah, so just a real quick comment on that. If you want to jump in, Jake, feel free. Um, the big one of the biggest things being multi-cloud is finding centralized tools. So instead of logging into each cloud and pulling the same security information for each one, or not even security, just our management tools of trying to keep these clouds, you know, the same and maintain, it's very hard for us. It's the biggest challenge for a system administrator and my team is the multi-cloud and different tools. So Prisma is a great one because it's a single pane of glass tool that you can use on all three clouds. We're looking at other options for monitoring and just for deployments that um, we're working internally to do the same thing, but it's great that Prisma's kind of taking the lead for that right now. 
and mm -hmm. just to sort of echo what Robert was saying, um, even on a good day for the administrators, they need to be versed in the three different technology stacks, know the differences and be experts. That's on a good day. When we go to a bad day and we're having problems in a cloud that relates to sensitive data, well, now your security team needs to be experts in all three of those clouds, which is very different. They operate differently. So there is this really large uh, deficit when we choose to do all three clouds simultaneously. Um, however, that's where we're going. So we, we work with that. And Prisma for the security group is kind of like a, a meta layer in between the clouds and the security data. So instead of having to pull data from three separate clouds and keeping the connections updated and uh, the parsers and all of that data coming in correctly, we're relying on the vendor to take care of that heavy lift portion for us. So that when we pull the data in and it's a security alert in AWS or GCP, it looks the same to the security team, security alert. It has the right information. And so that's what we've, we've been working on. Um, uh, Prisma is gonna offer us not just security because we talk about security, um, but compliance. And so it's gonna help us meet the requirements for P4 data in the cloud. So it's gonna help us with asset registration, vulnerability assessment, intrusion detection, uh, proactive blocking of things uh, as we choose to do uh, that type of work when there's large scale responses to log4j and things like that. So this being able to operate effectively across all three clouds either comes at a cost of a, a vast amount of training, security, and professionals, or having a tool that's really going to help us normalize all three clouds into one type of data source, which is security events coming out of a tool. Um, we're at phase one right now. We have the tool on. We've started it. We're getting some visibility with it. Phase two will be operationalizing it so the security group can continuously monitor and uh, tick it on. And then the third phase will be uh, rolling it out to customers. Um, Thank you, Jake. That's awesome. Thanks for that update. So it sounds to me like there's quite a bit of work that's being done with um, kind of normalizing the public clouds and um, having comparisons between those, but how do we compare the public cloud to um, the private cloud? I see there's a question in chat about this as well. How does the private cloud fit into this ecosystem? You want that one, Walter, or you want me to take it? <laughs> I, Amy went right where I was gonna go um, because I saw the question there and the cost of the private cloud is not posted. So, it's when we say the private cloud, it's really that VMware environment that we have where, and Greg mentioned it later on, on down here in the chat where it's like, you know, one of your first steps into, you know, quote unquote cloud might be just to go spin up a VM so that you're not actually, you know, using your own hardware, but you're just spinning up a VM within our VMware environment. Um, so that's, that's what we talk about when we talk about the private cloud that's there on campus. Um, and I'll let you take that, Robert, if you want to run with it in terms of comparison. Yeah, the, the biggest comparison that we have that a lot of our customers decide on is right now our private cloud, which is fully fleshed out and Walter said before is there, we have support and support levels inside of our private cloud. We have Windows teams and Unix teams to help fully deploy so you don't need to manage your own environments. When we look at our private cloud or the Berkeley, uh, sorry, public cloud, the Berkeley public cloud, we don't have that support level. It's mostly self-service. Once we get you there, you're responsible for your operating systems and the security level of those and making sure passwords are, are changed and patches are done. So that's the biggest thing I see. A lot of people that want that support all the way down so they don't have to, because they might not have these huge teams with system administrators to do patching and so forth. They will migrate towards the, or um, not migrate, but kind of flock towards the private so they get that fully supported model. And one of the questions, Amy, in your list was, you know, is support a big deciding factor in the cloud? And it seems like it, it isn't for a lot of people, but we get a lot of customers who want that support level. And that's probably one of the biggest things and cost. Um, right now, our, our Berkeley private cloud is pretty inexpensive. And that's just because we're running, like Jen said earlier, really efficiently. We're using very uh, small amount of power in the data center. And we're highly virtualized and we have it really um, efficiently tuned to run as many VMs as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, I will just say that we are going to take as many questions as we can at the end. Um, I did want to pivot a little bit over to Bill, um, because I feel like when I hear cloud, 
there's a lot of hype around cloud. Like people are very quick to just, oh, put everything in the cloud and the cloud is so cool. And I was wondering if you can talk about kind of the hype versus the reality of the cloud from your perspective. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'll do that and I'll try to do a drive-by answer to Harper as I'm doing that. Um, so, you know, when I was first writing that cloud strategy, uh, I'd like to track what people predict and then see what really happens. So back when I was writing that, it was like 2015, 2016, um, Gartner was predicting that we would have 111 billion worth of IT spend moved to the cloud in 2016 and the whole market for public cloud would be 216 billion by 2020. Um, so they were actually, they were wrong, but they were wrong in the wrong direction. So today the global cloud footprint is $450 billion with, um, United States companies only doing more than 200 billion in the public cloud. So for the sense of like, did it work and was it overhyped? They were actually understating it. Um, however, what they also did not get right, and this is where I think the hype and the sort of frothiness comes in, is, and I actually looked before the meetup at Gartner's latest um, predictions, and there was a caveat, and it said that Gartner cloud shift research only includes those enterprise IT categories that can transition to the cloud. So they're only looking at applications and some infrastructure and business processes. As I said before, that's maybe a fifth of what Berkeley needs from its infrastructure. And so those things, and of those, of those ones that they do look at, um, only about half of IT spending in those categories has shifted from traditional to public cloud. So to me, that means A, it's early days still. So there's much more cloud adoption to be had, and that means things are going to get more mature. And so we will be able to meet more of our needs in the cloud, but today, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we do that makes us uniquely a research university where we can't deal with that. And, and what's interesting about research universities is um, when I, we were looking at desktop support to make an analogy, the first thought that leadership had was let's get everyone on Windows and completely standardize on one flavor of computer. And it turned out that higher ed couldn't do that. We just had too many different use cases and were too distributed. And then what happened was industry stopped doing that because it didn't make sense. So we were actually ahead, not behind as the world became more heterogeneous. And I'm seeing the same thing with multi-cloud now. As I talk to corporate IT leaders, they are becoming multi-cloud. There's, it's just simply impossible to be a single cloud all in unless you're in a very narrow kind of business. But Harper's right that it is expensive and complex to use multiple clouds. And we may want to hear from Robert and Walter here. Our research enabling strategy is to support all the clouds, but from, uh, and we maybe want to hear from Jen, because from a central IT perspective, we do not want to be, create, you know, having reduplicating, solving the same thing in each cloud. So from an enterprise architecture, Berkeley applications and business needs and stuff like that, if you're in central IT and the stuff that we're providing for those customers, that is probably, we really want to contain to as you know, probably one primary cloud with an exception process. And then we have to recognize that if you know there's a $20 million grant to do research with Harvard and the infrastructure is built on GCP, we can't, we don't have the luxury of not being in that cloud. So mm -hmm. I will step back and then Jen, Robert, Walter, you want to take Well, and actually um, I do, I want to hear from all these folks. And I'm wondering if you can answer this question through the framing of how is what we're doing, how does it compare to the other UC campuses as well? Because I know y'all are in conversation with the other UC campuses. So what are we doing in this regard? And what have you heard from our peers? I think Robert has the data. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can take that. So we, we have these great communication between UCs for cloud owners. And uh, we actually recently just had a meeting for one of them. But um, there's two big pieces to it. There's the health organization UCs versus the non-health organizations. So there's, they, they run it very differently. Um, all, all the other UCs are seeming to do, if we take the health out, to do multi-cloud as well, because they're in the same situation we are. Is it'd be really easy to just support one cloud and, and cost-effective, but there's so many campus customers that want to use the other cloud, whether they get grants for that specific cloud or whether that just fits better. 
like running Kubernetes in Google is a lot, uh, it's just more native and easier to run than say in, in Azure or Amazon. You can still do it, um, but they don't. But one factor I think when you talk multi-cloud is we don't have a lot of customers or I can't think of too many at all that have applications in the multi-cloud. We're supporting three different clouds for different customers and those customers focus on one cloud for their applications. Like Bill said, Berkeley IT is looking to specifically use AWS, but we have a lot of researchers that want to use the compute in Google because the compute's a little cheaper there and it's easier to spin up and down compute, it seems to be in the Google from a researcher's point of view inside of Google. But as, as long as we're still multi-cloud, we're just not, I don't see a lot of applications spanning the cloud. Like one uh, application is in say Amazon and then it replicates to Google. We don't see that. We just see one customer focusing on one, but we're so big that we need to focus on all three. That, that's why I wanted to spell out the fact that this is the reason why we have a footprint in all three. We have a footprint in all three to be able to support researchers that might come to us that have you know credits or collaboration happening in one of those three clouds. And so we wanna make that a very easy on-ramp for them. And we want to do things like provide centralized billing and provide a very basic level of security infrastructure in each one of those. But again, it's a self-service model. So we, we, we don't provide more than that basic foundational infrastructure. We're giving people the opportunity to come in and do what they want to within each of these different uh, public cloud environments or somebody else's data center environment. I love that. Thank you for spilling that out. Um, <clears throat> but what I would say is that, like Robert said, if we were going to go into one of these clouds to be able to provide you know support for for example for all the BIT applications I think it'd be silly to try to architect that across multiple clouds it's like let's decide on one and let's go all in on one just because of you know not 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 just simplicity you know but it's also the people that are out there that are building these you know because you do it like Jake mentioned earlier you've got this problem that if you start spreading yourself too thin you know one person is gonna have to learn all the different ways of doing things within a multitude of different environments you know, not only the on-prem type of environment, but also in AWS, GCP, Azure. I don't think one person's capable of, you know, being able to do that very effectively. Absolutely. And Amy, I don't know if I so, finished the question, actually, to be honest with you, but the sure, other UC please. is doing something similar that we are for utilizing all three. And, um, but some of them, like, I'll just throw as an example. I know UC Santa Cruz there, they've, got a self-service model and a managed model. So they kind of uh, do both sides of the, the coin there because they've heavily done. And the one thing I will mention is I think last meetup, Bill, you had um, Carrie from UCOP here and they've focused heavily just on AWS because I don't think they have the campus customers coming to them with grants and so forth. So in their model, focusing on one cloud really is, is effective. So there's the UCs are doing mostly similar with a few outliers. I, I want to, I see Jen's hand up, but I just wanted to, give Robert a little grief because every time we talk about the fact that Santa Cruz has this managed service model for their cloud, if you go out to their website and you click on managed service for our, for our cloud, it gives you a 404. So don't get too crazy about that. So I'll pass it off to Jen. <laughs> Please, Jen. Yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm going to have to head off to another um, call and get ready for our all staff meeting. But I did want to make a couple of quick comments before, if it's okay, before I leave. Um, first of all, this has been a fantastic conversation. I love the questions in the chat. I know we probably won't get to all of them, so it would be nice to figure out how we follow up because this has been fantastic. I would also just remind people, as I was talking about, you know, continuing to maintain our competitiveness in in um, the higher ed market place, um, you know, our peers are not just UCs. And so one of the things that, um, you know, it's really important for us to do, even as we're looking to our colleagues in the system, and we're trying to leverage um, system-wide contracts and that kind of thing, which actually really help us a lot. Um, but looking to our peers, um, both in the public and private, um, in, in the public and private higher ed space, I think is really important. And I think it's one of the things um, I, I encourage us to, to stop navel gazing. It's one of the things I talk a lot about in our own organization and you know, really looking to what's happening externally um, and, and who, who are, um, I, you can call them our competition, you can call them our peers, but what are they doing? What are they offering to faculty, in particular faculty and researchers, to faculty and graduate students, um, and and are we in are we you know are we competitive in that place? Um, because again, that's how you recruit and retain um, you know the people that make this the number one public institution in the country. So I'll stop there. And um, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for letting me um, peek in a little bit on this. It's fantastic. Thank you, Jen. 
And we uh, we do actually have a hard stop at 155 today because of that Berkeley IT staff meeting. Um, so I agree with what Jen was saying. We're going to save this chat and all these questions and all this discussion. And Bill, what do you think? I think we should parse through it, see which are questions that need answers, which could be future meetup topics, um, kind of mind the mind this. Yeah, definitely. Um, if people want to bring dump any last stuff into the chat, we'll go through that. We can also send out a, um, for people who are part of Berkeley, like staff and students and faculty, we have a cloud community of practice with an internal email list. So we can share that. That is a great place. Um, if you're internal or external, we also have the Cloud Resource Center. And so there's an email there and it comes to some of us and then it gets connected with the B Cloud team, but we can also use that as input into the initiative. Um, so would love to keep a lot of this going. Yes, and actually, thank you for saying Cloud Resource Center, because Walter, you mentioned that and said that we should say a few more words about it. So Walter, would you like to talk about that? Sure, just real briefly, this was something that we put together back in 2015 or 16, 17, Bill, I think, when we were trying to come up with a cloud strategy. And really, the whole purpose of that is um, to try to catch people on campus before they go out and start doing something in one place or the other so that we can make it easier for them to do that. It's more important now that we've got these foundational infrastructures set up in each one of these different areas. So if you just like Google Cloud Resource Center, UC Berkeley, um, what we try to do is catch uh, input that comes in from questions that come in there. And if we do have someone, it's typically Robert or one of his people on his cloud team that will answer that. Uh, and if people want to have a further discussion, we tend to bring together like some of the some of the people like in this room that know more about these different cloud environments so that we can kind of you know focus people and actually send them in the right direction. I'd also say that we're trying to come up with a good, uh, like Robert mentioned, a good checklist in terms of like, okay, if you're doing X, Y, and Z, which one of the public clouds do we think, or private cloud, do we think would be the best uh, and most appropriate location for you to do that compute? And that'll be coming soon to a, you know, Zoom meeting near you. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. Um, Robert, Bill, Walter, do you have any closing thoughts to wrap this up? I think this is great. And by the way, thanks. Yeah, let's we'll take this. Uh, we'll take the chat away and we'll do some mining out of that chat, too, because I think we've got a lot there, uh, including the fact that, Zane, I think you're doing a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of the Cloud Resource Center, especially if you're working with Haas researchers and doing that kind of consulting function. That's exactly the kind of thing that we wanted to do with the Cloud Resource Center on, on a grand scale. So we'd love to tap your uh, mind in that one and see what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else to, to add, but it's a really fantastic conversation. And also, I'm really excited about getting connected with people that we haven't heard from either in the initiative. So we'd really love to keep that going. So please uh, join the community of practice. And also, don't forget next month. So we've got a fantastic speaker who I think, Amy, she works with you, right, in research IP. Mm -hmm. So we're really yep. looking forward to that topic. Absolutely. And it's not and at I... the usual time again. So it's on December 8th as we split the difference and thread the needle between two holiday seasons. One last request. I did get a private message. Somebody was wondering if the speakers could drop their contact information in the chat. So if any of you are willing to do that, please do. And with that, I wanna thank everybody. Thank you, especially to our speakers. Thank you for everybody for coming and participating. I'm so excited to mine this chat. This is. I'm a, I'm a data nerd, so this is this is excellent. So thank you all very much. And we'll see many of you over at the Berkeley IT All Staff. Everybody, hope you have a great day.